Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Good to be um, in the Word and it's lovely, just lovely this morning just to worship God together. Excited to do that each week. I'm extremely nervous this morning. Been uh, not that doing it that long, you see. Um, but uh, I, I find that whenever I handle the scriptures publicly, there's always a nervousness, and um, it has never went away after all of the years. And I sense that nervousness more, nervousness more than normal. And um, I think it'll unveil itself as we chat this morning. We're talking about the seed. Of promise is chapter three in the book, and um, last week we um, left Abram in Genesis 22, standing on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had um, provided a ram just as He was about to slay His son, and the Lord spoke. The angel of the Lord spoke and said, "Don't lay your hand upon the lad." He looked around and he saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket, and he took the the ram which became the substitute for his son. Now, we're going to come back to that at the end, but um, I'm going to take a trip through the Bible, and we're going to go back to Genesis 3, and we're going to go right through Abram, and we're going to go through Isaac and Jacob. We're going to look at his 12 sons, and we're going to go right to the New Testament. All right? That's going to be fun. So buckle up. All right? All um, right. I'm going to go through this. Don't let it freak you out. It's very small, um, but uh, I'm going to enlarge it in a moment in different places. And it's the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. It's the genealogy of the seed of the promise, all right? And basically, all you're going to have to do is follow my red arrow, all right? See my red arrow up there. So you just follow that, and um, I am going to try and do my best, because I felt, <clears throat> as I studied this this week, I felt early on in the week that it's so often we take for granted that everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, it's easy sometimes as preachers to say, as you all know. And I'm conscious that there's probably people in the room that don't know. Um, who is this seed of the promise? And where did it come from? And how did it develop? And, um, and where it came from? So I'm not taking that for granted. Uh, most of you will know, I'm sure, that the beginning of the story begins with Adam and Eve, the first man. Even those who are unfamiliar with the Bible know a little bit about Adam and Eve eating of the apple. It doesn't actually call it an apple, it calls it the fruit. So we're not dead sure whether it was an apple or not. But our first parents were led astray by the serpent who um, was the devil and sin entered the world by our first parents disobeying God. And they were put out of the beautiful Garden of Eden because in that Garden of Eden was not just the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, of which they weren't allowed to eat of. There was also a tree called the Tree of Life. And of course, after they had sinned, they, God could not allow them to eat of that because eventually they would die now. And if they died, he could redeem them if they ate of the tree of life, they might have lived forever, maybe. So they were barred from the garden, and that wasn't the worst of it. They were separated from God. This God who would come down and talk to them in the cool of the day um, was uh, separated from these um, two people, Adam and Eve. And so in the midst of all of this, God makes a promise, all right? And this is the promise in Genesis 3. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will, here's the promise, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So there's now two seeds. Your seed, the enemy and um, the woman's seed, he says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It's a pretty unique promise. 
And this is the promise of the Messiah to come, that there will come a day that while he will crush your head, and that's exactly what happened at Calvary, while um, it was just a strike on the heel to the Lord, um, he crushed the enemy completely. So the promise involved a promised seed, which we're going to try and trace this morning, and he pronounces this promise in a curse against the servant. And as I say, please note it's important that there are two seeds. Because the devil is a master counterfeit artist. He counterfeits everything. Right down to this present day. In um, 2 Timothy, I think it's 3.5. In 2 Timothy 3.5, he says that um, there will come a day when there will be a form of godliness that denies the power. We live in that day where sometimes there's just a form of godliness, but it actually denies the power of God at work. So the devil believes exactly what God says in this promise, um, which is why in Genesis 4, we have the first murder. And so what happens, the seed of the serpent, which is now working through Cain, kills the seed of the woman who is able. <clears throat> and we have the first murder. And so right away, right from day one, the seed is trying to be destroyed. The enemy is out to destroy this seed of the woman. But what happens is the woman has another, follow me arrow, the woman has another son and his name is Seth. And she says in Genesis 4, God has granted me another child in the place of Abel since Cain killed him. So wickedness runs riot. Um, Cain kills Abel in the field. Um, Eve is another boy called Seth, and it's him who the seed is now going to go through. All right? So let's follow this. All right? Wickedness runs riot. And we come to Genesis 6, and God is actually regretting in Genesis 6, 6, he's regretting that he made human beings at all. It says his heart was troubled, or I think the NIV puts it, God's heart was broke. You ever hear a parent saying, you're breaking my heart? Well, that's what happened. The people that God placed in the earth broke his heart. God destroys mankind with a flood, and he reestablishes a covenant with Noah and his three sons and their wives about replenishing the earth, and he says something similar to what he says um, in Genesis 1 and 2. He says to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. And so we've got Noah. We're way, way down the line now, and we've got Noah down here at my red arrow. If you backed up two people to his grandfather, his grandfather was called Methuselah. Some of you will remember Methuselah being the oldest man ever to live. He lived 969 years. It's interesting that Methuselah's name means when he is dead, it shall be sent. When he is dead, it shall be sent. And so Methuselah died and the flood came. And right away, right from the beginning of Scripture, we're beginning to see right along the way that God's redemptive plan is always in place. And his long-suffering, going as long as he can before the judgment comes. Now, um, we eventually come down to Genesis 11 and we come on a man named Terah and he has a son called Abraham. Here we are, we're right, we're jumping down the line. Wow. And God makes a promise to Abram and we've seen that promise last week and this promise involves the seed. He says to Abram, through your seed, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others, and I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. So this man, Abram, is a very special man. God has narrowed the arrow down to um, a family, to a man, and, uh, but this promise is rather significant because he and his wife, as we seen last week, are too old for sin. So how do you get promised seed if the seed-bearing couple are too old? Well, the answer is God must intervene. And um, we looked at how Abram tried to help God out in the process of that and birth 
Hagar in the midst of all of those silent years when God wasn't speaking, but Ishmael wasn't the seed because God didn't say a seed, he said the seed. There was a special seed and the Isaac was that seed. And so what happened was Abram died at 175 years of age, but not before he found a bride for his son Isaac, all right? And Isaac, you read about this in Genesis 24, Isaac carries his own miraculous story of conception for 20 years. Um, his wife was barren, Rebecca, uh, no babies, nothing happening. Um, and once again, God moves through a barren womb and they eventually the prayers are answered and twins are born and they're called Jacob and Esau. And maybe as we study this, we begin to see that God is trying to make these broken people into sons and daughters, teaching them um, to wait, teaching them uh, a time lapse, that there is a, 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 a preparation to partner with him and wait for God to move in his time. Now, Esau is the older brother, but um, God hasn't chosen the older one. He's chosen the younger because this is not about birth order. This is about election, and that would be a sermon for another day. And so we come, we jump down another one, and we come to Jacob. And now Jacob's a manipulator and a deceiver. His name means that. And he manipulates and deceives Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of soup. And then later deceives Isaac for the blessing reserved for the firstborn who was Esau. And um, um, Jacob literally steals that blessing. He flees. Uh, and on his way on the run, he, and he has a dream. He sleeps in this place and he puts a rock down to put his head. And he falls asleep and he has a dream. And in the dream, he dreams of this ladder, a stairway to heaven, and this ladder, this stairway, went right up into heaven and touched earth. Again, we've got the gospel story right there. Something that touches earth and touches heaven um, is a pretty incredible thing. And uh, this, you just see the gospel story, redemption story, shown all through these, this incredible seed. God declares that Jacob will steward the promise of blessing that flows from his father Isaac and from his grandfather Abram. He lives with his uncle Laban. He falls in love with Laban's daughter called Rachel and he's madly in love with her and he does a deal that um, Laban says, if you work for her for seven years, you can have her. So he works for her for seven whole years and uh, on the night of the wedding, um, Laban deceives the deceiver and gives him Leah, the older sister, instead. And he didn't love Leah at all. But he woke up in the morning. I don't understand why, why he didn't realize he was sleeping with the wrong wife, but he was. And um, he, uh, he goes to Laban and said, you've given me the wrong wife. That's not Rachel, it's Leah. And, of course, Laban says, well, you can have Rachel as well, but you'll have to work another seven years for her. So he gives him... So he, he ends up with two wives and he's to work yet another seven years for Rachel. This is more than just a love story. This is an election story. All right? Now he eventually ends up with 12 sons who will become the head of the 12 tribes of Israel. You can read about that in Genesis 29 to 31. But the one he loves cannot bear children. And the one he doesn't love can and um, the one that he does love doesn't bear children away to the end of the story, and she bears him two sons, one's called Joseph, and the other's called Benjamin, whom, while she was birthing, she died. It's a heartbreaking story. Now, Joseph is loved above all the brothers because he was the beloved son of the beloved wife, but he was not the promised seed, all right? He's the protector of the seed. He was sent down into Egypt to protect the seed, but he's not, he's not the person the seed comes through. He's just the protector of the seed. Now, the woman that Jacob didn't even want started to give birth to children, and um, she gave birth to Reuben, to Simeon, to a guy called, a son called Levi, who became the father of the priesthood, and then to a, a son called Judah. Let's jump down another one. Interesting. Um, now, while we're introduced to Joseph in Genesis 37, in Genesis 38, we come across a horrific story um, 
about this guy, Judah. Judah, by the way, is the one who actually wanted to sell Joseph down into Egypt. He actually wanted to kill Joseph initially and then got him sold down into Egypt. Um, But in chapter 28, um, through a horrific story that I haven't time to tell you about, um, he is betrayed by his um, daughter-in-law, whose husband, two husbands, she married Ur, one of Judah's sons. God killed him because he was wicked. And so the tradition would have that the next son had to marry um, Tamar, which he did, Onan, and he was wicked as well, and God had to kill him. And so the younger boy, Sheila, was too young for Tamar to marry, and Judah said, you go back home to your parents, and when you're of age, um, whenever Sheila's of age, you can come and marry him. Of course, Judah didn't keep his word, and Tamar thought she would catch him out, and so she dressed as a prostitute, and she sat on the outskirts of the city, and when Judah was coming in to buy some sheep, he hired this prostitute and slept with her. Little did he know it was his daughter-in-law. She tricked him in that she kept some of his belongings. And when it was found out that she was pregnant and were about to stone her, she produces the belongings and Judah realizes he's guilty. So it's a horrendous story, really. And um, I, I sort of wondered why it's there. I wondered why I put that chapter in the midst of the story of Joseph? It's a really good question. Well, the reason it's there is because the story is not about Joseph. Even though we read about Joseph right through to chapter 50 of Genesis, the story is about Judah, all right? And and because it's about the seed, you see. And, And then why show Judah at its lowest point? Why would God do that? Well, the reason I believe he was doing it was because he was trying to redeem him. He was trying to redeem him. And eventually he did redeem him when Judah actually, um, later on in the story, when Benjamin was to be sent down into Egypt and Jacob wasn't having that at all, Judah said, don't you worry, Dad. If he doesn't, if they're going to keep him, I'll be his substitute. Imagine that. Imagine Judah, this man who has committed incest, this man who wanted to murder his brother, is the one whom through the promised seed is about to come, and he says, I'll be on, I'll be the substitute. Now, the, the, the Judah goes on to have a son and another son and a sons, and then great, he becomes uh, the great, 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 great grandfather of this guy where my red arrow is now, David. So we're right down to David. Now, David is just like his father, Judah. He shows up on the scene like his great, 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 great grandfather, and um, this is a powerful story. Um, now, if you jump up, Two, three names, you'll see I've underlined a name, and um, just in case you can't see it, the name's Boaz. He's David's great, great, great grandfather. You maybe recognize his name from the story, the little book of Ruth. He, he married Ruth, but his mother, wait for it, is Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot. So, The most incredible thing, as you trace this line, you will find broken people just like you and me. You will find family messes. You will find power struggles. You will find incest. You'll find deception as God twists and waves his way through a myriad of people, broken people just like you and me. Now, here's the the cool bit, all right? When you come to David, you have a sort of a double whammy. All right, when you come to David, um, one of um, his sons, Solomon, which is to the left, right, um, he, he is the lineage of Mary. To his other son, Nathan, is the lineage of Joseph. Now, if you read Matthew 1, you will find Mary's lineage, all right, if you've ever, hope you haven't skipped over them because they're really important. Matthew 1, in the genealogy, it follows Mary's line, if you read Luke 3, it follows Joseph's line. So this is pretty incredible. When it comes to David, it's a bit like, you know there's an old saying here, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, it's a, it sort of feels, when I've been studying this, it feels like when it comes to this, God, God just says, now, now I'm going to make sure this works out really well. And, and, and the seed from David comes through both lines, Joseph and and uh, Mary, right down through the line. It's pretty incredible. 
And um, when David shows up on the scene, when he finally identifies himself as the promised seed, he brings forth his presence with authority. He walks down into a valley as a boy in 1 Samuel 17, and he makes this proposition to fight a giant three or four times his size, and he says, if he defeats me, we will serve you, he said to the Philistines, but if I defeat him, you will serve us. So David goes down to fight this giant as a representative substitute. He's saying, um, I'll stand in the gap. I'll stand in the gap. You see where this is going, don't you? Because thereby, when he, when he defeated the giant and cut off the giant's head, he won the victory for the nation of Israel. Now, um, if you wanted to go away on down from David, you would come on David's greater son called Jesus, whom the seed came from, promised right up from God, right from the beginning. And he is known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's why Judah was the seed. And so when you open up the New Testament, this genealogy basically screams at us that God who made the promise in Genesis 3 has just fulfilled the promise in Jesus. And he's fulfilled it through all of these generations of people. It's pretty incredible. And the enemy has tried time and time and time and time again to destroy that seed. Even when Jesus was a boy, Herod would try to wipe out every child under two in the nation to wipe out this seed. But this is the pretty incredible thing because this is the greater son of David. This is the promised seed who will crush the head of the snake. And what does this greater son of David and greater king who is called Jesus do? He becomes our substitute. He lays down his life. He accepts the wrath of God poured out upon him that he might win the victory on behalf of God's people and all those who are found in him will be rescued. God's weaving down through generations and through people now to this point of time where we stand in love with this incredible Jesus. If that's not a story, I can tell you I don't know what else is. And when it comes to Colossians, when Paul is writing to the church at Colossians, this is what he talks about. He says, for he who has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, I love this verse, you hear me quote it all the time, has transferred us out of that kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son of his love. He says, who purchased our freedom and forgive our sins. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow. Isn't that unreal? And here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you look at the systematic makings of God, you see down the left-hand side of that, you'll not be able to read it, but there's 14 generations between Abram and the Babylonian captivity. Then there's another 14 generations, and then there's another 14 generations generations. This is pretty incredible. Matthew's genealogy is structured in sets of 14 generations, which has a numeric pattern designed to emphasize key moments in Israel's history. And while 14 is an interesting number, it's seven by two, as you will know, signifying completeness and perfection. And it was very symbolic in the Jewish um, numerology. I have a little inkling too. It's linked to Daniel chapter 9, which states the 70 weeks, which are 70 weeks of 7, which if you multiply that are 490, um, and uh, would pass between the restoration of Jerusalem and the coming Messiah, since the generation was commonly known as in around 35 years, um, 14 generations, you can work out the, the, the maj yourself. Um, but I said I would come back to Abram, and that's where I want to finish. 
Sarah is going to come because I want us to pray this morning. I really do. Um, as Abram stood on that mount with the first child of that promised seed, pretty incredible how God had honed it right down. And um, as I started to put this together on Monday of this week, I began to feel God really trouble me about this. And I thought, felt God tell me to do what i just done. I'm not dead sure how it would work out. I wasn't dead sure. I practiced that so many times. But I'm not dead sure how it would work out. But I felt God tell me to do it. I'm just being obedient to it. And I felt God tell me to do it because he said, I felt the Lord said this to me in my study on Wednesday. Um, praying for you, I felt God say, there is one person, and maybe there's more, and I hope there's more that this is for this morning, but I felt there was one person in this room that feels they're at their wit's end. When Abram stood on that mount and he lifted his knife, and then the angel of the Lord said, as it's on the screen, don't lay your hand on the boy. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God and not withheld me from me, even your son, your only son. Abram looked up, saw a ram caught by his horns in a thicket, so he took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son, and Abram named the place Yahweh Yireh, or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And I've said all that to say this to you, that person this morning. And this might be a businessman or businesswoman wondering what way to turn. This might be a marriage that is struggling this morning and you're not dead sure how to get through this. This might be uh, a family issue, wayward child. I don't actually know what it is. But I feel the Lord wants me to tell you this morning that he's Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Jireh. And in all the twists and turns of genealogy, of this seed. I don't think there's any one thing in that twisted line of genealogy that could not be in this room. Brokenness, hurt, disappointment, discouragement, betrayal, incest. On and on we could go. And wherever you are this morning, I'd love us just to, as we worship this morning, I'd love you to to reach out to God. We're going to worship, and then I'd love just to pray. Our prayer ministry team are here, front and back. And um, I, I, if that particular person, I would love to chat to you too because you give me some work this week. Um, and it was a lovely journey, and I loved it. But um, Jehovah Jireh, God, I pray this morning as we worship we maybe stand if you're able to this morning let's uh, worship together we're going to come back then and pray for us and lead us but just our prayer ministry team if you want to head up in the back and front that would be great um, and uh, Sarah's going to lead us in the song mm. don't have to wait to the end of the song if you're in the worship you feel God really speaking and something's jumping in your chest right now and saying I need to respond. I need to. Maybe it's maybe maybe it's something outside what I mentioned. Maybe you're not even that one, <laughs> and you feel you need um, someone just to stand with you in prayer this morning. Then this is the time for that. Thanks, so. Jehovah
I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. So I open up my heart to you. Cause I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started As I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave So oh, I'm not here for blessings but Jesus, you don't know As we close, um, God is working in our hearts, and the thing that strikes me in the story of the seed is just the perfection, even the, when you look at the 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, it's almost like, well it is, God just brings perfection brings perfection out of brokenness. He makes beauty out of ashes. He makes a stream run in a desert. He makes hills, plains. That's what God does. And nothing is too difficult for God. And as we've just sang, I just want you, that's our closing prayer, God, we just want you, Jehovah Jireh. And maybe um, we used to sing years ago in the um, and my brethren, days when I was a boy, I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they mocked, mocked me as I wheeled. And there's something about the broken cisterns um, that we've tried to drink from. And there's nothing like the Jehovah Jireh, the God who is your provider. And so we're going to finish here where time's gone and coffee and the foyer. Leave, leave quietly if you have to go and lift kids and stuff. I'm just going to ask Sarah just to play this quietly. And I do sense that God really wants to minister to people. And um, if you want to avail of that, please make your way up to our, our ministry team.
Rick and I and at the front. Some of our elders are here too. And um, we love, we just love to pray for you. We love to minister to you. We love to see God breaking through in your life. So God bless his word to you. And seal it in Jesus' name we pray. Let's worship. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.